uh, Kelly Rogers isn't able to be here this morning, so I've been asked to fill in. <coughs> uh, the first reading is from Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chap- uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 5 and verse 8, where Paul is commending generosity as an inspiring sign of love. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and, by the will of God, to us. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25 and is the parable about the three servants who are giving talents. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master returned, and came to settle accounts with them. When the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you handed me over five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy with your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed me over two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, "Uh, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seeds, so I was afraid, Uh, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked, lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him in the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God help us to understand these words. I don't know, Vera, you sounded like you were having fun reading that passage. (laughs) Uh, Well, it is Stewardship Sunday. That day when we celebrate the blessings of the gift of this church, when we share our needs and our vision for the future, 
And when we give thanks to all of you who support and make these things possible, and we have much to be thankful for. When you think about it, Jesus actually said more about how we use our time and our talent and our wealth than any other topic that he spoke about in the Gospels. You think about it as the story of the widow's might, the story of the rich man, the rich young ruler who went away. There was the story of Lazarus and Dives and that chasm that existed. The story of the Good Samaritan who helped out a stranger and then used his money to put him up at an inn where he could be taken care of. There was, of course, Jesus on the Thursday before Good Friday when he wrapped himself in a towel and washed the disciples' feet and asked us, his followers, to do likewise. And today we're using the parable of the talents as a small expression of the many times Jesus spoke on it, as if this is very important. Now, a talent, what is that? One's given one, one two, one five, and it's to be an image, it says in the beginning, of what heaven is like or the kingdom of God. Well, one talent was the equivalent of 6,000 denarii, which was the equivalent of 15 years' salary. So two talents would be 30 years' salary, and five talents would be 75 years' salary. That's what you call the owner giving an abundant wealth of blessing. And, of course, it's meant to be an image for God, giving us this wealth of resources for us to invest and be blessed to be a blessing. So what are some of the blessings? When you think about being part of St. James, what do you consider some of the blessings? I'm sure for many, it's the music. You know, fantastic week after week of a, an exquisite caliber that is inspiring and that is a joy to be part of, and to be challenged and to grow in and to feel, you know. And what a wonderful, that was a treat this morning, Valerie. And Bill, those solo parts, it was beautiful, beautiful. Then the Sunday school. How many Sunday schools do you know that have a computer lab? I bet when you went to Sunday school, there was no such thing, right? But that's incredible that we have a computer lab and those kids got to each one of them to choose pictures to go with a a verse and to be engaged and able to share it and be the leaders instead of only the recipients, to be that engaged. That's an inspiring Sunday school. And Karen as the coordinator leader of that, but all of the teachers, we are blessed. You know, the Reiki ministry and integral healing and those meditation methods I mean there is support for people when they're in hospital and they're hurting. There's support for people when they're going through cancer and painful experiences. And they come back again and again, in some cases every week, because they feel that it genuinely helps them. And we know that it's, some of their doctors have said, it's shrinking the tumors, or whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Or maybe it's only to raise their white blood cell count so that they can go back for another treatment yet again. But it is a loving, caring ministry that many receive with, you know, great gratitude. And even the people doing it love it. They feel like they're making a difference, and they feel like there's the Spirit of God that is flowing through them, and it connects them, in a way, with a deeper spirituality. Of course, we've got things like Seniors' Luncheon. We've been doing that for 17 years with Evelyn Porter, beginning that. Now, Pat Dunstan and Sandra Dryden, not even a member of our church, 
being willing to make that possible, and Lois McDonald coordinating the program each month. You know, just to bring people together in friendship and organize rides. You know? The amazing food basket ministry. I mean, it is truly helping our neighbors. And don't forget, there's geographic boundaries that we're only serving our neighborhood. And it's still 2,000 people a month. About seven to 800 children. Here's three of the people that we're helping every week and that we're also going to be invited to consider giving them a Christmas to remember. We're going to be collecting during Advent donations and some, well, I'm hoping, will volunteer again to go shopping for these families and we're asking them what they most need. So they'll be telling us what to buy. But here's some of the scenarios We've got Nathan and his wife. He's 32 years of age. He's got, they've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Shortly after arriving in Canada from Nigeria three years ago, they discovered that he had brain cancer at 29. He underwent treatment for that, and it has been clear for a year, and he's been working. And he just got news that it's come back. And he arrived at the food basket again this past week, just looking so depressed and discouraged, so exhausted with the treatment beginning again. And with two youngsters that take so much energy at that age and not really being up for being there for his own children, and just that uncertainty at 32, of what the prospects for the future are and the worry for his wife. We want to give them a Christmas to remember, as well as the caring weekly help and support that they get here. There's another family that just arrived, the Backer family. She was a medical doctor in Egypt. He was a pharmacist. They were, you know what's been happening in Egypt, Huh? They were part of that protest of the government, activists seeking some reform and some, some democracy. And they had to very, very quickly leave the country with nothing and three children, ages 10, 14, and 16. They came with nothing but what they had on their back in September of this year, two months ago. She right now is, you know, she's a doctor, but she's taking pre-med exam at the University of Toronto, hoping to, you know, be eligible to go on to take some qualifications to work in some kind of health-related field. And he's taking a professional English course so that, again, he might be able to work not as a pharmacist, but as an assistant pharmacist. Once again, he can requalify. But they need help in this transition and finding a new home here when they know no one. We want to give them a Christmas that says, welcome to this country and that we care about you. And then there's the Hong family. The one um, woman came to Canada and married a Canadian they had a son together, and when he was about a year old, she had sort of a nervous mental breakdown, and her husband left her. And they actually had the former ambassador from South Korea, where she came, send her sister and family, ask them to come to Canada to look after the sister. They are here on a, quote, caregiver, caregiver visitor. They're not allowed to work, but there's five of them looking after the sister. The dad would love to work, be landed immigrant status. They have three children. Two of them were born here in Canada, age two and age seven. They also have a... 13-year-old, and he 
can't get landed immigrant status after seven years of trying and being sent here to look after the sister, his wife's sister. We want to give that family a Christmas to remember. But it's the kind of support they're getting every week. This church is making a difference in people's lives. And even the moderator of the United Church, when she came here in September, said to me, this is a unique congregation that is exceptional in our creative programs and in our balance, our holistic balance of caring for people and justice issues and music and inspiration and just the variety that we offer, that we are one in a million, if you will. We have something to celebrate. And it is only because people care enough to make it possible that it is. So what does it cost to keep St. James open? If we had no ministers and no music, if we just opened the doors every day of the week for the building alone, and has some custodial services to keep it clean. We paid the insurance and the utilities. So just the property, if you will, it costs $74,000 a year. That's about 50 cents per person per day, or $3.50 a week or $182 per person per year, or $364 per couple per year, just to open the doors. Now, what if we said, we just want Sunday worship. We just want the choirs and the music professionals and the Sunday school and a message, and still the custodian, and someone to print the bulletin. Got to have all that. So operate the sound system and have a nursery caregiver. Just for Sunday. $138,000 a year. So that's $6.80 per week per person, or about $350 per person per year, just for Sunday. But look what we would be missing. If we want everything that we offer, the whole caboodle, it's about $18.75 $18.75 per person per week, or $975 per person per year. Finance Committee is estimating that we're probably going to be ten dollars to $20,000 deficit right now for this year, which is about... 25 to $50 more per person. I know not everybody can give that. And thank goodness there are people who can give so generously and do. But I want you to think about it in one more way. Do you think God's ministry through this church is worth one hour of your income per week. One hour. Is God and this church worth one hour of your income per week? That might be $5 a week or it might be $100 a week. But if people gave one hour of their income, we would exceed our budget. That's all it would take. Isn't that an interesting way to think of it? Will I give one hour a week to God?
Now let me tell you my some of my vision. How many were here last night, by the way, for the gala fundraiser? That was so fantastic. It was brilliant. And Nancy and Vary deserve huge thanks and gratitude. You pulled that off beautifully, and I can't hardly believe you're still here and standing today. Uh, if you see them, either give them a massage in their shoulders or their feet or something. I know that uh, the whole, well, the three sisters, and although they were, you know, and Dylan, they were in that kitchen for about 14 hours straight, standing between Friday and Saturday, uh, chopping and pre-cooking and serving, um, and it was a magnificent meal, uh, one of the finest I've, I've ever had. And the young people volunteered their time, and the Seventh Etobicoke Scouts volunteered. And they were brilliant serving us and coordinating. You know, and what's even more amazing is the people who have no association with our church, none, but who gave. I mean, Frank Formella, the chef, to do 14 hours in the kitchen Friday and Saturday, to be of the caliber of Canadian culinary chef, there are so few of those in the world. You have to reach such a standard. And for him to volunteer as a gift with no expectations of anything back, and in addition to that, he even brought in and donated a great big wood chopping board that's beautiful, that's now a new addition for the kitchen. Just generosity when he doesn't even come to this church. And how many of you liked men to boys? (laughs) It was fun, wasn't it? I mean, you know, they were entertaining and lighthearted. And you know what? They cost zero. They donated their time again. And, you know, that kind of generosity just inspires, it touches the heart when people are willing to do things for us who believe in us who aren't even part of our congregation. You know, because there is a joy in giving and a belief that it makes a difference. And when you feel that way, then you just want to give. You're just so grateful that you can't help it. And we have visions. I have a vision. I don't know how long it'll take to fulfill. Don't know what you think of this, but I've got at least three visions for the next couple of years. How many of you would love and care enough about people with joint difficulties, back, knee, hip, ankle, and you see them having trouble coming up the stairs to the sanctuary. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a ramp, that floor from the lounge to the top of the stairs could be a gradual sloped floor? For about twenty to twenty five thousand dollars is all it would take. We could do it if we cared about the people that have mobility issues. Now, how many of you, I know you like food. It's obvious you love food. I've already heard that you'd come again to that. I'm not sure that the people who did it think they're up for it yet again, but. You know, it was so good. Now, I know there's people in this congregation who have specialties. You know, they're good at baking muffins. Or they're fantastic at soup. Or maybe it's pies or cookies. But I believe we could have an incredible hospitality ministry here. And wouldn't it be wonderful if once a month those people who just loved to bake, you know, came and brought their stuff to a Sunday hospitality and we sold you a piece of the best homemade pie you could imagine. 
We could become famous for that one Sunday a month. And people from the surrounding community, when they got to taste that baking, would come here for that Sunday just to get the baking. I have a vision that we might even in the future be able to hire a chef part-time. Why not? Why not? Imagine if we could hire someone even for five hours a week. They could help with the food basket. They could prepare a brunch for us on a Sunday every so often. We could be there with a caring meal when someone came out of the hospital or someone was caring for their family. And we could be there with a homemade meal for them. We could offer cooking classes for children or adults here and teach a different style of cooking each month. And if whatever amount of time is enough, when you there's this investing in neighborhoods grant, and if you have a paid staff person who can supervise, you can have the city pay for an employee who might want to become a chef. What an incredible ministry it could be that could be even an ongoing fundraiser for the church if we just invested a little bit of money to hire someone or to share our own love of whatever we enjoy preparing. And I'm serious about that. If someone loves to bake or cook or make soup, I want to know. I genuinely want to know because we want to use it as a talent and share it. And you know what the owner said in that parable of the talents? To the one with five who invested it and doubled it, and the one with two who invested it and showed fruitfulness in return, used it, blessed to be a blessing, the owner and God says, Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my presence. May our lives be met with that commendation of God. And thank you to those of you who do make a difference and make this incredible church possible. Thank you.